And as you heard in the testimonies, a lot of people just this morning learned some things. So 11.30, we go soul winning on Saturday. We'd love to have you there. All right. Um, so Esther um, felt uh, a pretty good amount of time ago um, when she was a teenager that God had called her to ministry and to be in full-time service for the Lord. And uh, so um, she, uh, as she... Uh, um, became an older teenager. Um, she had a lot of interest from different men and good guys, and uh, but none of them were. Uh, well, some of them weren't going to go in ministry, and although they were good guys, she felt that wasn't her calling for life, and she's supposed to be in the ministry, and and uh, so uh, there were uh, d- several different circumstances, and and people. We, there were possibilities, but um, in the end, uh, uh, Andrew and her started become pretty serious, and him and I talked, and. And uh, he has uh, given his life to serve the Lord in the ministry, and he comes from a great family, and uh, we're very uh, proud of to have him. And uh, so they got married, and they're enjoying serving the Lord together. And uh, and uh, you know they're they're they challenge each other. They they become better Christians. They work together. Um, they're a team, and they're very proud of them and see what where God's going to take them in their future ministry. Don't forget, we're uh, just uh, giving today. If we don't, we're not necessarily having an offering, the offerings are in the back um, to help them. Um, they are living by faith in their ministry right now, and uh, so we'd like to be a blessing to them. If you could give something uh, to them, that would be great, and we'd send that to them. All right, um, Andrew's going to come on up and uh, preach to us tonight, and uh, let's uh, go ahead and give a big hand, and we'll listen as he preaches. All right, good evening. Uh, if you turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 19, we're just going to learn, uh, just going to uh, read one verse there, and, uh, and then we'll pray. Luke chapter 19. <clears throat> chapter 19, and then we'll read, uh, we'll read verse 13. It says, And he called his ten servants, and delivered them ten pounds, and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Let's go ahead and pray. Dearly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity that we have to serve you. God, I thank you for the opportunity that you've given me to open your word with your people and to look for what it, w- what it is that you would speak to us about. And Father, what you've already spoken to me about. And Father, I, I pray, that, uh, pray that you would just give me the wisdom to know exactly what it is that you want me to say and to say it in the way that you want me to say it. And Father, not to say the things that you don't want me to say and that I would say of myself. And Father, just... Uh, Glorify yourself tonight in the opening of your word and in the learning of your people. And, and Father, that your, your power and the glory of Jesus Christ in his word, through his word, might rest upon this place tonight. And we might learn and be better able to serve you and be better, uh, better willing, more willing to serve you with our lives, God. Glorify yourself tonight. And we ask these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we have this verse. We have Luke chapter 19 and verse 13. It says, And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. And I, had a, I, the, now the, I have a message called Occupy Till I Come that is on this uh, passage, but this is not that message. Um, but I want to start off with it because that, that, that is the basis of what we do. It's occupied till I come. And a lot of people sometimes think, we, we think, you know, in, in the English language, words have different meanings. And they can, the same word can have several different meanings. And so a lot of people think about the term occupy, and that they think that means to take, take up that place, to fulfill that spot. You know, you're occupying the chair that you're in right now, that kind of occupy. But the occupy this is talking about is a different kind of occupy. And it's that, it's that kind of occupy where... Uh, a football player, when he, when he runs down the, down the field and somebody throws the ball to him and he picks that ball up and he tucks it under his arm and then he says, I'm going to do the most that I can with this ball. And he runs for that end zone. That's the term occupy here. It's to pick it up. It's to pick up what we've been given and do the very best, the very most that we can do to fill it, to work with it, to, to move it forward in some way. And we know through the Bible that we've all been given a, a specific place in that, a specific role in that, in, in the world to go out and share the gospel, but also in the church. There's a specific work that each person in this church has to do Amen. in this body. Amen. So we have this, this, this command to occupy, but what I want to talk about tonight is the idea 
that we hear a lot about in, in our day, and that is, that is the idea of sleeping in our work and sleeping in our life. We hear a lot, of, a lot today about the church that's sleeping. The church that's just, that's just not moving. They're not active. But what is it to, what is it to sleep this is the question. God gave me this, this sermon. It was a few months ago, and I was sitting in a service in Pennsylvania, and the other gentleman was preaching, and, uh, and he started to work on my heart. What is it to sleep? If there's somebody were to ask you, uh, in your Christian walk and in the church, what does it mean when we say the church is sleeping? Because we talk about it, Especially like, you know, one of the, if, if, if we as traveling through the United States, if we, if we preach inside a church, which the goal is to preach outside to the lost, but if we preach inside a church, we, it's to, we want to have an impact there, to move it, to, to, to revive a little bit, to encourage it, depending on where that church is at. But what does it mean when we say that church is sleeping? No, well, to sleep, it's to, to not be aware of what's going on. It's to not be aware of what's happening around us or, and, and, and not to be active ourselves. That's what it means to, to sleep. And then the other thing that happens in our sleep is a lot of times we begin to dream. We begin to have this idea. I had a weird dream the other day. For some reason there was a toad with a sword and uh, it was fighting and I don't know why. That was my dream that I had the other day. But we have this vision that goes on in our head sometimes when we dream, and we see this whole other world. We see this whole other, this whole other life, and sometimes we're in the dream, and sometimes we're not in the dream, and uh, a lot of times we have some control over that dream. I like to direct my dreams sometimes when I'm kind of semi-conscious and I can choose what happens. But we have this dreaming that goes on when we're sleeping. And I think in a lot of ways, the church today, Christians today, we're not only sleeping, we're dreaming. How many, how many of us have that, that we have work a job, and I used to, I used to have a job that uh, I would have to get up at you know, 3.30 in the morning and then, and then head to work every day, and uh, how many of us, when the alarm goes off or whatever, we dream that we got up and we hit our alarm clock, and then we went and we used the restroom, and we went and we, we got our breakfast, and we got in the car, and we drove away, and eventually the alarm clock actually does wake us up, and we realize we were just dreaming all of that, so we didn't actually have to get up. That's happened to me quite a few times, and I know that. But I feel like a lot of times the, the church is doing the same thing in a lot of ways. I read a, 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 a story from Plato. It talked, I don't know if anybody here knows it, but it was called The Allegory of the Cave. And the whole idea was that there's these guys that are stuck in a cave, and they're stuck facing the back wall, and somebody's lit a fire, and there's shadows being thrown on the back wall. But they're stuck. They're tied to a post, and all they can see is the back wall. And so they can't even see each other. They can't turn their head to the right or left and see each other. They can only see the shadows. And so they begin to think that the shadows are reality. They hear the voices of the people on either side of them, and they think that those voices belong to those shadows. Those shadows are reality. And so they, begin, they, 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 they invent this whole world based on what they see right there, these shadows. And the whole idea of the allegory is that when a person comes to their senses, and they, they, if somebody were to cut one of those guys loose, he begins to look around, he sees what's actually going on, and then he turns around and he finds out there's an opening to this cave. He goes up to that opening, the light hurts his eyes, but eventually he gets used to it and he starts to see what's going on around him. He starts to see what the truth is. But then what happens when that guy goes back and speaks to the same people that are still tied up? He starts to look crazy because they still think, they still think that's truth. They still think that's reality. That's right. And so a lot of times, you know, and, and, and uh, a lot of times, like I said, that's exactly what we do is, as Christians. I feel like we get this idea and we run with it, but it's not the correct idea of what we're supposed to be doing or what we're supposed to be going on. And I just want to talk for a moment from, from what we've seen, and that is that as we're, as we're traveling throughout the United States, we're trying to encourage Christians. We're trying to encourage people. to. And there's a lot of discouraged pastors, discouraged preachers, discouraged Christians that don't have a whole lot of contact with anybody else. They don't have a whole lot of active people, and they're just, they're just tired. So we're trying to encourage them. But in a lot of ways, there's a lot of churches that just don't seem to see the responsibility. They don't seem to see, like Pastor was talking about this morning, they don't seem to see the responsibility that we have to, to ask, how can I please Christ? Amen. They're asleep. There and we, ha we, we have to be... 
Now, in saying that, I want to say we have to be vocal in our, in our, our love for one another. The, the, the idea in going to somebody and helping them grow is not to go and just, just condemn them for where they're wrong. Because that's not, the devil does enough of that himself. We're supposed to help them grow, lift them up, and teach them. And each church, in, if we looked at in, in Revelation, each church was dealt with individually, and that's exactly how God still deals with the churches today. But first, but two issues here. One is the sleep, but the other one is distraction. Now, here's the question. What's the difference between sleep and distraction? I want to paint a picture in your mind. Think about a car, and you're in the car, and you fall asleep. What's going to happen to your car? You're going to crash. You're going to wreck. But... Let's paint this other picture, and you're in the car, and all of a sudden you get distracted by some twinkly thing on the side, and your eyes are not where they're supposed to be. What's going to happen? You're going to crash. And so we have, this whole, we have this whole world, and especially in this country, we get so distracted. And the devil doesn't care if he can put you to sleep or he can distract you. Either way, you're going to crash. He doesn't care what the difference is, and really there's no difference in the end. But in, the, in, in, in America, we get so distracted. Even me, as I get distracted, as I'm studying for a message, I start to begin to, my, my brain starts to wander. And then there's this thought that comes in that says, well, let's, let's watch a YouTube video. Let's just take a break and we'll just watch a YouTube video. And, we say, and then I go and watch a YouTube video. And I'll tell you what, it's really hard after I see that whole narrative to get back into thinking biblically about things that really matter. And that's so many times what happens with us. We get so distracted with the things that are going on in life. It gets really hard for us to go out and now think. We have so many things going on in our brain that we've seen that aren't real. How are we going to see what's real when we go out? And I heard this, uh, I'll tell you one more, one more uh, illustration of this that I heard a while back. And that is that uh, I heard this psychologist guy, he's not, not saved. He's um, coming to the knowledge of Christ. But he was talking about, maybe some of you know him, his name is Jordan Peterson. And he's coming to the knowledge of Christ, but he's not there yet, I don't think. He's not there yet. Uh, but he was talking about the narrative world versus the real world. And the narrative world is what we tell ourselves our lives are. It's what we tell ourselves what we think is real. For Christians, our narrative world is the Bible. It's our lens of Christianity. Now, we know it's real. But it is also what we tell ourselves. And the point that he was making is that Jesus is the only place in history where the narrative world met the real world. Because everybody has a narrative world. But Jesus is the only place where the narrative world, what we tell ourselves is true, came to actually be true and show itself as true. But that can work in the reverse as well. And a lot of times we have a narrative world and we say we teach ourselves all these things, just like the alarm clock. We teach ourselves all these things are true to relieve ourselves of what's actually true. And so I want to talk about that for just, for just a short while here. And uh, while I was praying about this, while God was speaking to me about this, he gave me five things because he was convicting me that that's where I have been. Amen. And what is it like when we wake up? And we realize that, that what we think is true, what's been going on in our head, this narrative that we tell ourselves, what happened, what's the difference, what's it look like when we come out of that? And I'm, not, not, I'm, not, I'm not here to say that I'm fully out of it myself. There are still things God's teaching me that I think that aren't quite what he thinks. Okay? But what is it? I'm going to give you five, five things, and we probably won't be here long tonight, but I'm going to give you five things that uh, I, I've, I've entitled this message, Living in a Fantasy. Because we create this fantasy. And so I want to think five things uh, that we realize when coming out of that fantasy. Number one is that we're living in a fantasy if we pray fancy words, but we don't conduct serious business with God. Turn to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7. Matthew chapter 6, and we'll look at verse 7. Verse 7 says, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Now, I always traditionally have looked at this verse and seen it as, as you know, think that we can't pray like, like we can't just go in and like meditate. You know, we see these prayers where people are just going up and down and up and down and they're just quoting this thing that they've memorized. Or we see the, or, you know, we see the, the, the person that's sitting there and they're like, and they're just saying random words. That's exactly what I've always thought this meant. 
was that we don't pray as the heathen do, and we, just don't, we don't just memorize prayers and say them as a rote prayer. But then God convicted me. What happens when we go? And I'll tell you, I have, been, I have been very, very guilty of this for a very, very long time. What happens when we go and we, and we just start praying all these fancy words? We think we're using biblical language. Like, oh, Lord, my God, you're so wonderful. You're so great. You're so amazing. I love you so much. I just want to serve you with my life. But then we never ask him to give us a soul to speak to. We never ask him to actually provide for a need we have because in our hearts somewhere we're afraid he won't actually meet it or afraid we will actually have to meet, meet that soul that needs him. What started to convict me about this one, Hudson Taylor said he saw prayer as doing serious business with God. He said it was a business transaction. Now he talked with God. You know, you talk with people at work. And so he did. He talked with God. I'm sure he had a good relationship with God. But he said, prayer power has never been tried to its full capacity. If we want to see mighty wonders of divine power and grace wrought in the place of weakness, failure, and disappointment, let us answer God's standing challenge. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. So what, what are we, what we get to, but we get to this place, when I was a kid, we used to have a men's prayer meeting every, every week. And I learned a lot from that men's prayer meeting. But I'll tell you what, there was a lot of Christians that I don't, I don't judge them for it, but they weren't really doing a whole lot. That's right. But they could, they could sit around a table and say a lot of fancy words and sound really awesome. Yeah. Now they did something for me as a kid. They taught me how to pray from the heart, because that's what I learned sitting there with them. But there there was a far cry from that to when my parents, we, I grew up in a pastor's home, and there was a time we had no vehicles. And the, the, uh, our mechanic was one of the guys, he was in the church, he said, I don't have any money to be able to give the church. He was, very, he was a very, very uh, low-level mechanic. Like he didn't, he didn't have a whole lot of customers, but he was good. And he said, I don't have a lot of money to give the, give the church, but I'll keep the pastor's vehicles on the road. That's my tithe. And so he did. He kept our vehicles on the road, but there came a point where our vehicles would not be kept on the road any longer. Right, right, right. They had too many Band-Aids. And so he got up one day and he, said, and he said, we have a responsibility to take care of the pastor, and his vehicles are gone. They're done. They've, lived, they, they've breathed their last. We need, to figure, we need to figure this out. And we had a small church, didn't have a whole lot of money, and, uh, and, and, and there was kind of a ruffle in the congregation uh, little ruffled feathers, and my dad got up and he said, he said, that's, that's Tom, that's, that's great, that's wonderful, we, we're glad you feel like that, but God will take care of us. But I'll tell you what happened when we went home was our mom got, uh, sat, sat us down, and she said, he was right, our vehicles are done. She said, but that means we need to pray. And we fasted and we prayed three days. We, we all, our whole family, there's seven of us, we fasted and we prayed three days, and in, in three days, God provided two new vehicles. And the next Sunday, we, that was from Wednesday to Sunday, we were able to get, got, dad, dad was able to get up and say, in this week, God provided us two new vehicles. And there's a far cry from us going to our prayer closet and praying a whole bunch of fancy words about how much we love God and actually conducting that serious business that says, God, you are active in the real life. You are active in my life. How can you help me change? How can you help me do more for you? And, and how can you help that person find you? And I love, I love going to God and just talking to him. And there's so many of the Psalms that talk about us just praising God and us telling him how great and wonderful he is. But sometimes we get into this fantasy where we think we're praying so much, so much and so good because we spent an hour, but we never actually asked him about anything. We never actually mentioned anything that applied to our day-to-day, -to, -day, to their day-to-day, -to, -day, to the lost world out there. And we're living in this fantasy where we think we have a good prayer life, but we're not conducting any serious business with God. Okay, the second one is that we're living in a fantasy if we think that simply reading our Bible every day will show us approved. Like Pastor Byram said, and this is what I learned from that message, I've never heard this before, that at the beginning, our Christianity and our relationship with God makes us happy. But then when we mature, we begin to ask what makes you happy. Now, that, that, that resonated really, really, really strongly with me because it's, we're all, we all are on a growth process, and we have to, we do, we have to be uh, gracious with people who are, who are not quite as grown as we are. I think there are a lot of people in a lot of churches that we wouldn't necessarily agree with. They do love God, but they're baby Christians, and they're still just, they're still just ruminating in the milk, in the grace and the mercy and the love, and they haven't come to the point of what can we do for God. 
But we're living in a fantasy if we think that just simply reading our Bible every day will show us approved because we think, okay, well, it's here, it's here like, it's like they said, to make us happy. It's here just to, just to encourage us. It's here just to tell us about, about how we can live more spiritually minded, but we're not ever actually doing anything with our hands to serve God. We're not actually doing anything with our feet. We're not actually going out and just serving him with our actions. We just read our Bible every day and we think that's good. And I'm telling you, I don't, I'm not, I can't think of anybody here. This is the, only the second time I've ever been to this church. I can't think of anybody here. And I don't think that this church is like that. But there are a lot of Christians who are. And if I'm not careful, I am. Very often, it's so easy to say, you know what, I read my Bible this morning, so me and God are good, and I'm going to go live my life. That's really easy to do. Turn to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. Verses 1 through 4. And they say, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat... Wait a minute. Am I in the right spot? Oh, six through eight, sorry. It says, He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself... And no man dieth to himself, for whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. A lot of people don't understand what we say. We say, when you, become, when you get saved, everything matters. There's nothing anymore, there's nothing about my life now that I have that accountability to God. Now that I know that I have that accountability to God, that my life is patterned on what I see will please him. There's nothing in my life now that doesn't matter. Not my dress, not my walk, not my music, not my words, everything. And I'll tell you what I've become convinced of. I've seen a lot of young people who have taken, and they've taken everything that, that, that they've been traditionally told, this is the way, you know, this is a, way, a good way to, to, to please God. Whether it be their dress or their music or whatever it is. And they take it and they say, you know what, I wasn't really taught. And a lot of churches are really bad about this. They, they teach the what, but not the why. You have, to, you have to do this, but there's no, nowhere in there that they say, this is, why, this is why it will help you. This is why it pleases God. This is why it shows the world that you're a servant of Jesus Christ. So then they take and they say, I've only been taught to do this. I have no idea why. And they drop it. And they just start throwing off all, this, all the things that they've done their entire life. Now, I'm okay with questioning the things we do because questioning, if we're doing it right, will lead us to a biblical, godly conclusion of ourselves and not of our parents. And so here's what I've become convinced of. I've become convinced that the person that studies what, the, what God wants them to do is always more right than the person that just doesn't. Because there, I, I, I am very strict in a lot of the things I believe, there's other people that I have, that good friends that I have who are not as strict in the same things that I'm strict in. But they've studied it out. And I've studied it out because we both wanted to know what pleased the Lord. And both of us, although I believe if they continue to study, they will come more to my side of things. Because <laughs> that's growth. And they're just not there yet. <laughs> but both of us, regardless where we end up, will be more approved than the person who doesn't stop and ask what pleases the Lord. Does this action in my life please the Lord? Amen. Because that person didn't care enough to say, what does God actually, you know what, like I don't, I don't believe that, I'm not saying me, I'm quoting them, uh, like I don't believe that, you know, music matters. We can listen to whatever. And they just drop it. And they never stop to think, what well, does, does music please the Lord? Amen. I'm okay with questioning it, but go study it. Figure it out. And we're living in a fantasy that we think simply reading our Bible every day will show us approved a lot of times. We just, they're like, okay, well, as long as I'm just, I'm just willfully following the Lord, I don't actually examine the things I do, that's okay. Galatians chapter 6. Oh, that's where I got mixed up. Galatians chapter 6. Verses 1 through says, uh, 4 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. 
Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. We are to prove our work. That's biblical. And then we look at James chapter 1 and verses 25 through 27. And they say, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a, a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So if it's not backed up by our actions, how real is it, really? If it doesn't make a difference in our life, how much are we actually believing it? But a lot of times, that's exactly how we treat our Christian life. And we do some little thing in our private life, in our private home, where nobody sees that we're different, where nobody sees that we're a peculiar people, where nobody sees that we believe something they don't, and we think, now we're okay before God. <clears throat> but how real is it? Hudson Taylor also said, God isn't looking for people of great faith, but for individuals ready to follow him. That takes great faith. I'm just going to put a little addendum there to his quote. So number three, we're living in a fantasy if we think that Christian activity within the church only is the same as faithfulness and constitutes reasonable service to Christ. Amen. This one, and I'm, I'm not being judgmental here, but this one, I've said more churches are in this one than anything else. Really, really good at inreach, bad at outreach. Really, really good at inreach, bad at outreach. I can say this, my church is one of them. My home church. Always, baby, we are so good at inreach. People come, they grow, they learn, they, 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 they lo learn to love God, they get their feet set on the, on, on the right path, they start to really serve God, really read their Bible, really study, really pray, but we're not so great at getting the gospel out. We're not so great at affecting the world around us. <clears throat> The other thing is that attendance is not service. <laughs> attendance is not service. We do need to attend, but all of us have a par part to play. Even if, even if you pray and God just convicts you with the fact that you're supposed to come in with a smile and be an encouragement to your brothers and sisters, that may be your part to play. And so many people don't, don't think about what part do I have to play? What can I offer? The, 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 the door greeter is one of the most important positions in a church. Make people feel welcome. You know, even if it's just the, 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 the contribution of a good attitude, that's a, sometimes in a church service, that is one of the <laughs> best things a person can offer. But we all have something to offer. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. First one. Second Corinthians chapter two. <clears throat> and verses fourteen through seventeen says, And also, as also ye have acknowledged us in part that we are your rejoicing, even as that's sorry, that's chapter one. All right. I will try again. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God speak we in Christ. We are, think about that, we are the savor of Christ to God the Father. We are the savor of Christ. We think about the fact that he said the salt, if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? That's our savor. It's the savor of Christ to them that perish because we're a witness and to them that are saved because we're, we are serving him among the body. <clears throat> and then uh, 1 Corinthians 15 In verse 34, it says, Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. And then verses 57 through 58 says, 
But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We're living in this fantasy if we think that Christian activity within the church only is the same as faithfulness and constitutes reasonable service to Christ. And this is the thing. This is the real sting of the fantasy is that when we get to the end of our life and we go and we stand before Christ and we're like, I've been super faithful to you, always attended church. I was always there morning, noon, and night, Sunday, Wednesday. I was at church. And he says, well, how many names are in here that you talk to? How much of that talent did you share? Or which portion, at what point, at what point, at what point was, was the church more than just the pew? And it was how, what you could impact the other people in the church with. But that's so many people, so many times. I'm writing a book right now on uh, song leading. I'm not, a good so I'm not as good a song leader as even your song leader. But I love song leading. I loved it, loved it, loved it. I did it for years. And what I've seen as we travel is that there's so many, so many song leaders who are missing out on such an opportunity because they are asked to be a song leader and they, 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 they get up, they sing a few songs, and they get back down. And that's it. That's all they do. They don't, they don't smile. They don't. My, job, my goal as a song leader was to get the people in the church to really worship with their singing, to really praise God. And a lot, you can do that with your attitude even. And that's what Brother Datuin is always reminding us. Sing with your heart to the Lord. But there's a lot of song leaders who are missing such an opportunity. And there's a lot of Christians who are missing such an opportunity because we come, we sit, and we go, and that's it. Number four, we're living in a fantasy if we believe that one day we won't have to battle our flesh to give the gospel. It's a battle, and we need to face it as such. And I'll tell you why I'm talking about this one, because I was in that trap for a long time, for a long time. Like, I liked it. I, I mean, like, I... I gave the gospel at work and all this kind of thing, but I always thought, I always had this thought in the back of my head that eventually God was going to do some great work in my life and now I'm just going to have a holy boldness and that's it. Amen. But it's a battle every day. Amen. And we have to face that or we're not going to be as effective. But a lot of Christians, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that a lot of Christians are thinking, eventually God's just going to do this great work and I'm going to have this holy boldness and that's it. And then, then I'll really do a great work for Christ. But we know in Romans chapter 8 that we are fighting of the flesh. That's where Paul says, and I'm not going to turn there right now for sake of time, but that's where Paul says, you know, that which I would, that which I would do, that I don't. That's right. And that which I would not, that I do. That's right. It's always a fight, and we have to fight it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. But we have, to, we have to face it with that awareness that it's going to be a battle. That's right. And that's the battle we're fighting. Um. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, and we'll turn there real quick. Ephesians chapter 6. Overlook verses 18 through 20. And they say, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul prayed for boldness. Why? He was battling his flesh. Amen. To not be bold. But again, like I said, a lot of Christians, a lot of Christians, I, I firmly believe, I know because I was there, think eventually, if I pray enough, if I read enough, if I learn enough, eventually it's just going to get easier and now I'm just going to do it. When the reality is, we just got to jump in. Amen. We just got to we just got to put ourselves in the situation and then give it, Amen. share it. Amen. Okay, and then number five, we're living in a fantasy if we think that what's ours is ours and we won't give an account for it. Amen. We won't give an account for it. Second Corinthians chapter five. Turn to Second Corinthians chapter five here. Uh, Verses 10 through 11. And they say, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one of us may, everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. 
but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciousness. This one comes, this, this verse comes to my mind daily. We don't like to think about knowing the terror of the Lord. Because we, get, we, because we want, we want we, you know, it comforts me, it makes me happy, it makes me feel good. And he does all of those things. But there's a terror. There's a terror of, of standing before him one day. William Carey said, he said, I'm not afraid of being a failure. I'm, being afraid of being a, I'm afraid of being a success at something that doesn't matter. I'm afraid of being a success at something that doesn't matter. That's what I'm so, so scared of. Before I went back to Harvest uh, Baptist Bible College there in Iowa, I was on course. I was, I was taking internet courses to be a, to, to, to be a healthcare professional. And uh, I was still headed for the ministry. I knew I was going to be in the ministry, but I, I figured at that point I had the idea that all pastors are bivocational anymore. It just doesn't happen that you can't be. So I was going to get a good job. That way I could have the time to, to do the work. And God took me out of that. And I'm glad he took me out of that. I'm fine with it. He's going to provide for me. And if I have to work, it's, he's worth it. Amen. But, <clears throat> uh, but we have things that are given to us. And, and that was the thing is I could have been a success at that. I loved it. I loved what I was doing. I, I was a truck driver at that point. I loved truck driving. Loved it, loved it, loved it. But I could have been a success at that and never, never, never dropped it to go serve Christ. We're living in a fantasy. We think that what's ours is ours. And we won't give account for it. And let me explain here real quick why I'm mentioning this one. Because a lot of times we take as Christians what God's given to us and we live a really good life with it and never use it to serve him. Amen. And, and again, we have to know the terror of the Lord that one day we're going to stand before him. And if we, if, we, if we think we can just take what God's given to us and just, just live this super happy life and never serve him with some of it, with it, with ask what he wants us to do with what he's given us, then one day we're, gonna, we're living in a fantasy, that distraction, and we're not thinking about the fact that we're going to stand before him for it. That we're going to stand before him for it. That's right. We're going to stand before him. He's going to say, I gave you this and this and this and this. And what did you do with it? Right. And the fantasy was, I can live my entire life and just have a good time and God will still be pleased with me. Mm-hmm. We're living in a fantasy. And then the last fantasy, and I won't turn into passages for sake of time, but the last fantasy, and it's, and it's not a fantasy of the saved because not just the saved lived in a fantasy. I am so convinced anymore. It came a couple of years ago. I talked to people about Christ and asked them, like, do you want to accept? Do you want to accept? And they'd be like, no, no, it's later. No, no, it's, it's you know, it's not something, I, I'm not going to do that today. Mm-hmm. And people will just, and I'm like, I'm like, what's real in your life? You, you, go, you go to work. You, you don't want to be at work. You're not really working for work. You're just working for a paycheck. And then you just plan your activities on the weekend. So it's work and, and work and activities and work and activities and work and activities. And I'm like, what's real? What's, what's important in your life? Where is, the, where is the base of... But the thing is, in our country, the devil's done such a good job at distracting people that they can, they, can sp- they can spend their entire work week thinking about what they're going to do on the weekend and then go and think they spend their entire work week thinking about what they're going to do on the weekend and they never get to the point where they, they're asking, what's important? What's real? It's just, they're distracted right into hell. And you know what? They don't want to think about it because, because that's hard. Because it's, it's nice just to be able to just do what I want Amen. and just go and live my life that's right. and that's it. And that's our, so that's our job is to bring the reality, the realness to them of the gospel. But we're not the only ones living in a fantasy. So the last fantasy is, is we're living in a fantasy if we think that one day we're not going to have to answer the question whether we believed in Jesus Christ, whether we were saved. Jesus is offering that gift. For anybody here who hasn't accepted him, who hasn't believed that he was the son of God, that he came and died for our sins, that we have to accept him. For anybody who hasn't believed that, Jesus is offering that right now, and we're asking you to come out of the fantasy and believe in him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for everything you've given us, and I pray, God, that you would just be glorified in us as we seek to, to come to the knowledge of the ideas that we have about life that aren't in accordance with what you tell us life is. And what, what's gonna, what we're going to be doing with our life, what we should be doing with our life. I pray, God, you would help us to seek how we can be more real 
in what we tell ourselves this life is according to your word. In your precious and holy name, we ask these things. Um, all